What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Sheehan Show with me, Sean Sheehan, here on Sherdog.com. Um, and it's another judging show I'm doing for you here. And the reason I'm doing it is that the... Uh, <laughs> uh, what I just said, the coals on UFC 279 are still warm and I think that's important right for a judging show because we have to remember at all times and I've wanted to do a show like this and I, I, I picked the right moment to do it I think we have to remember at all times in the midst of all the chaos and maybe last week was one of the most chaotic weeks in the history of mixed martial arts or at least the most chaotic maybe three or four hours <laughs> in, in the history of mixed martial arts or one of them we've seen many especially around that uh you know the, the 11 month mcgregor madness and the brock lesnar madness and lots of diff- different things we've seen many uh, f- uh fake complies of, of insanity uh, around mixed martial arts i suppose over the years but this was one of them as well. And I wanted to come on here and talk about judging in the middle of all of that. And the reason I want to talk about judging in the middle of all of that is because the judges have to judge in the middle of all of that. And if we look last week, as a, <coughs> we had uh, UFC Paris, and that was madness. Absolute madness. It was one of the maddest crowds we've ever seen at a UFC, I would say. And I've been in the ones in Ireland and the Bellators in Ireland and everything like that. And the absolute madness in which those uh, cards happened, um, I think intensifies how hard it is to be a judge, but also shows that to be a judge, you have to be able to live in those moments. And to be a good judge, you have to not panic in those moments. And now, unfortunately, and you know, people, people sometimes call me the head of the judges' union and things, which you know, I, I've probably earned that <laughs> over the last while standing up for them. Uh, one judge, at least, was not able to do that. And uh, look, there's lots of reasons to stand up for judges, and I'll actually get into some of those reasons here in, in a few minutes. But one judge wasn't able to stand up to that in UFC Pi. Right. There was the madness there, and uh, we'll get to the decision in a second, and the, the one round that was uh, was scored incorrectly, because sometimes it's it's hard to say there's an incorrectly scored round, but there absolutely was one here uh, in Paris. And I, I, th- I think we must understand that as well, right? The judges don't really do interviews anymore. Unfortunately, I've spoken to a, a couple of one judge at least been carried two or three times um, on uh, over in Severe and May before. Great interviews, and I think gave a great insight into how judges, you know, um, live and work and humanity around them as well. And just you know, going home to his wife or his dogs or you know someone else going home to you know their to work or going home to their you know their kids or going home to whatever it might be. These people are human as well, and I think we have to remember that. Um, but we also have to remember that humans can achieve things, you know, when put through uh, the the ringer to achieve greatness. In the, and, uh, you know, great, I'm not saying greatness in terms of what Seal Gagne or Nathan Diaz or anything got, but greatness in terms of being able to execute a right decision at a right time. And that takes practice. Um, and, it, look, it takes an awful lot to be able to do that. And... As I said, I'll say it again before I get into the specific rounds and the specific specific uh, parts I want to talk about. Um, the, all of the madness that surrounds all of us. Like I remember sitting there on on Friday evening waiting for the wins to come on the ceremony wins. I'm like, who is going to fight who? What fights are going to be happening? Then you come, it's like, oh yeah, which fight's happening now? And on Saturday night, like, who's walking? Oh yeah, that fight's happening. There's just madness around, and it's easy just even sitting there at home on our couch to kind of lose your head and go, oh, this is this is just absolutely crazy. As someone me who analyzes fights and is like tweeting out about them or doing podcasts about them and getting the analysis of them, it's 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 madness. Just you know, sitting at home thinking about all the different integers that are going to decide all of these things, and in the midst of all of that, you have three people sitting cage side who are trying to judge fighter A versus fighter B punch versus punch versus submission versus takedown versus slam and all of this in the most logical cold um, proper way possible 
Imagine that. Imagine how tough that is. Imagine how tough that is with 25 roaring, 25,000 even roaring French people behind you in the first ever event there. Imagine how mad that is when everyone's booing Shemayev. Imagine how mad that is when Nathan Diaz walks out and there's a close first round and there's a close second round and there's a close enough third round. Imagine how tough that is. It's really, really, really tough. So I have great sympathy for these people and I made a point to make a podcast at a time like this. Because we need to remember, I'm sure people are listening to a podcast about the fight. Maybe you're listening to the analysis. Maybe someone interviews Shamayev or someone interviews Diaz. Or there's a, going to be, I've done it myself and other people will be doing breakdowns of the card as well. But in the midst of all that, and maybe you need a break from that. And maybe this is your, your podcast to get a little bit of a break from that for, uh, for 25 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it might be. Just to think of that. To think of of where we are in the sport, and we need these judges to give us these results and do all of that, and they're human as well, and they have to perform in the way that the criteria states, right? And they have to do that. Now, for the most part, over those two insane uh, events, they have done that, right? And maybe you know, maybe it'll be a good point to to actually go through uh, all the decisions here in a second. But the first thing I want to do is go to the bad one, right? Now I've I've given them all the credit. I've said we we need to be nice to them, and now I'm going to be a bit bad to them. So there was uh, for the first time in a while, I would say, and uh, <laughs> and uh, well, look. For the first time in a while, there was a card that you can say was a hundred percent without a shadow of a doubt wrong. There's lots of cards. There's lots of cards I disagree with, and that's always going to be the case. And we'll get more into that in a, in a while here. Uh, there's some cards you're going to say, well, do you know what? I don't think that was good judging. Uh, going further than just disagreeing with them, you know. And there are, uh, you know, f- actually very few of them. I would say at the highest level these days, but there are. Almost none that you said that is absolutely categorically wrong. And we had one here at UC, UFC Paris, and it happened between William Gomes and Jarno Ehrens. And it was the third round uh, of their fight. And the judge, Christoph Chapus, gave a 10 10. Right? So. Before we go any further and we talk about the 1010, let's consult our rule book. Because if you go to the, look up MMA judging criteria, go to the abcboxing.com link and you'll find it there. I'm sure maybe John will pull it up on screen here and we'll be able to read through what uh, a 1010 is. Because it's uh, it's pretty well defined and uh, it's it's uh, one paragraph with a couple of lines above it. So I'll, I'll just read that there very quickly. A 10-10 round in MMA is when both fighters have competed for whatever duration of time in the round and there is no difference or advantage between either fighter. A 10-10 round in MMA should be extremely rare and is not a score to be used as an excuse by a judge that cannot assess the differences in the round. A 10-10 round in MMA is a necessity to have for the judge's possible score, mainly due to scoring incomplete rounds. It is possible to have a round where both fighters engage for five minutes uh, and at the end of that five minutes uh, period, time period, the output impact effectiveness and overall competition between the two fighters is exactly the same. It's possible but highly unlikely. If there is any discernible difference between the two fighters during the round, the judge shall not give the score of 10-10. Again, this will be an extremely rare score. And that's it. That, that's all. Everything that you need there about 1010s in the judging criteria is right there. Right. So, first of all, it should be extremely rare. That's just overall, if you're, if you're talking to someone, it's, it's extremely rare we see a 1010, right? The next part, I think, uh, that is, uh, is very important here. It's not used as an excuse by a judge that cannot assess the differences in the round. Now, that is what happened here, I would say, in this round, Right. And the last part, which I would say is very, very important, is a 10-10 round in MMA is a necessity for a judge to have mainly due to incomplete rounds. That's why a 10-10 is there. If you're asking yourself, why is a 10-10 even in the judging criteria if we never have any? That is the reason for incomplete rounds. Let's say there is an accidental eye poke at four seconds of the third round. You And it goes to the judge's scorecards and there hasn't been a punch landed or whatever. Um, that's a 10-10 round. No one has had any effective offense or anything like that, right? So that's why a 10-10 is there. Pure and simple. There's no other reason. 
There's no other reason. This is a score that's not given. This is a score that is a background score that's there for mad things that we usually don't see in mixed martial arts, right? That's why a 10-10 is there. It's not there to score around. You can't decide a winner between. Judges are, judging is a verb, right? And judges are sent out there to judge rounds. They're sent out there to pick their winner. They're sent out to see 10 punches from one person, 10 punches from another person. I know I have five fingers up, but you know what I mean? And discern who had the biggest impact in those punches and pick a winner between the two of them, right? That's what your job is. And people are probably, you're probably thinking like, well, what is there? What if there is no difference, right? Now, if you're good enough of a judge, you should be able to tell a difference because no, no two punches are the very same, right? Are able to look at someone's reaction and say, oh, that person was hurt a little bit more by that punch than the other person. Now, it's very rare you see a fight where there's 20 punches landed by one person, 20 punches landed by other person around, and it's the exact same amount of damage landed, right? Very, very, very rare you would ever see that. And if it is, you have two more areas of the criteria to go to. You can, and people, ne- the judges, the high level judges never use these either. They're only there as a backup again, right? So you have the 10 10, which is a backup. You have octagon control, which is a backup. You have effective aggressiveness, which is a backup. And then you have the effective striking and grappling, which is your primary, uh, primary, primary criteria, criterion even. So, That is what's used. It's the effective striking and grappling. If there is any of that, if there's one punch landed, if there's one punch each landed, you judge on that and you forget about the rest. It's like, I always make the comparison. I hope, look, there's probably some American uh, listeners and viewers coming into this, so bear with me for a second, but it'll only take a second. And It's a very clear explanation, right? In the Premier League, you for winning the game, you get three points. For drawing the game, you get one point. For losing, you get zero points. At the end of the season, you've 38 games. It's all added up, right? That e- easy is that. So, two teams, Liverpool and Man United. Liverpool get 100 points, Man United get 90 points, Liverpool win the league, right? Easy, simple, no problem. That is your first level of criteria. But if what if they both get 100 points? Who d- who wins then, right? So then you go to goal difference. Who has got the most goals and conceded the least, right? You go to that, but you only ever go to that if the points are equal at the end of the season, you only ever go to the octagon control or the effective aggressiveness here if the effective striking and the effective grappling are absolutely even if Man United and Liverpool are both on 100 points. That's the only reason you'd go there, right? And that's before you go to a 10-10. So in soccer as well, you've got who has the most goals scored and then the winner has decided on that. There's another backup. But you never go to that. You don't even decide it. If, if Liverpool win the, the, the league by 50 points, it doesn't matter if Man United have a goal difference of 50 and Liverpool have a goal difference of 7. Doesn't matter. As long as the primary criterion is met and you win. If you have more points at the end of the season, you win. If you have better effective grappling and effective striking in MMA in a round, you win that round. And the effective aggression doesn't come into it. The effective... Uh, uh, or the octagon control doesn't come into it, and then the ten ten doesn't come into it. And now remember that as well. P- people seem to forget that, right? At times, ten ten is not the score you think of when you're around. Ten ten is like the fourth base which you get to in the judging criteria. There, there's three areas of the criteria, right? As this, I'll say it again: the, the effective grappling, striking number one, effective aggressiveness number two, um. The cage control number three. And then the fourth thing you go to, if you can't discern between all that, is an even round of 10 10. That's the fourth thing you get to. God Almighty, tell me around where you can find that. Even rounds like Rosnam Yunus versus Carla Esparza. There are strikes landed in that fight, right? Maybe it was only two, but that's enough. There is, there is offense there. A tiny bit, maybe, absolutely, but there's enough offense there. If one person lands a shot, Decide it on that. Decide. I know, maybe you disagree with that. Fair enough. If you do disagree with that, fair enough. But we have to remember as well. So I think, I think I've think i explained the 1010 part of it here, right? And I'll get back to the judge here in a second and all of that. Now, on what I just said there, on disagreeing with it, you can disagree with it, okay? I might disagree with it. There might be 50 people listening to this. You know, 25 people might have one idea. 25 people might have the other idea. 
But what we have right now is what we have right now. It's written in the rules. It's written in the criteria. And we have to go by that. If you're judging on Saturday night in uh, in Paris or judging uh, Tony Ferguson versus Nathan Diaz, you know it's not. You know this is not pre-recorded because it said Tony Ferguson versus Nathan Diaz. And it's, it's after the fight. I, I promise. Uh, four round submission, was it? Yeah, that'd be a good prediction if it was true. But... You, you can you can disagree with 10 10s you can disagree with how 10 9s are scored you can disagree with how 10 8s are scored but that disagreement must be towards the commissions in terms of changing the rules that disagreement cannot be towards the judges who are implementing the current written rules and the judges who are implementing the current written rules also can't disagree with the criteria they're handed these rules go out and do it if you're a mechanic and you you know you wanted to 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 fix your fucking car. You're handed the uh, and you've a Ford Fiesta. You're handed the the notes for the engine. You know the the book, the manual book. Well, this is a terrible analogy because I have no idea. But you're handed the book for the Ford Fiesta. If you're handed the book for the Toyota Corolla, it's not going to be any good, Joe, is it? You might say, oh well, the Toyota Corolla is a better engine. It's a better car. Well, what good is that to me when I have a Ford Fiesta? Do you know? You, that's what you're working with and that's what the judges need to work with and the reason I said this was an incorrectly scored round and it was wrong is because the judge who scored this uh, Christoph Chapus went into business for himself he scored this round a 10-10 he, he panicked he is a newer judge um, who you know it's the first ever event in France the first ever UFC event in France now I spoke to a couple of judges about him and he go, look, he's a good up and coming judge. He has uh, d- done uh, Aries fights and other things like that. And like someone kind of said to me, look, he probably just panicked. He probably just panicked, didn't really know who to pick and go, look, I'll pick a 10-10. He pro- two minutes later, he's probably thinking, oh, why did I do that? I know the rules. I've read this criteria. I just, why did I write that down? He, I bet you he was saying that. He, But he made a mistake without a shadow of a doubt. You cannot give a 10-10 here. Now, let me say it again. If your opinion was, well, that's a close round, Sean. It could have gone 10-9 this way. It could have gone 10-9 that way. What's so wrong with a 10-10? Well, the, what's wrong with a 10-10 is it's written in the rule book that you can't give a 10-10 in that situation. It is literally written in the rule book you can't give a 10-10 in that situation because you have three ways to decide who wins a round. There was many, many, many strikes landed in that third round. I, will, I don't know how many, 50 maybe, at least. You have to decide between that. It was a close round without a shadow of a doubt. But you have to decide. A judge's job, if they're leaving their family and their dogs and their their job and going away for the weekend and doing this, they have to go out and do it. You're, You're sent there to do the job and you have to do it. You cannot not do it. You cannot go against the criteria and pick who you are and not pick... Um, someone in, in that case you can't go out there and not pick someone so you know that's that's my thoughts in the 10-10 it really is my thought um, on that fight as well right and this this is a massive thing in mixed martial arts a massive and shout out to our friends over at MMA Decisions as well they do an absolutely fantastic job and always do you look at Christoph Chappas over here in MMA Decisions you click into him right he has two fights and he's MMA Decisions Farah Zian versus Mikhail Figlak and William Gomez versus Ahrens, both of which happened on UFC Paris. And he's the guy who gave the 10-10. Two judges who I have great time for, David Leatherby and, and Clemens Werner, both scored the fight the same. Um, if you click into David Leatherby in MMA decisions, he has Scummy Ahrens, Austin Bocciu, Chadwick Mesa, Will Flory fight, a C fight, a mix fight, an Odzimir fight, a Nathaniel Wood fight, a Makaya fight, a Dalby fight, a Figlak fight, a uh, Shevchenko fight, a Storley fight. That's to 2022. Do you want to go to 2021? He has UFC 267, loads of fights there, K- uh, Cage Warriors, KSW 2021, another Cage Warriors, another UFC, another UFC after that again. He's, you know, had championship fights in Cage Warriors, a, a couple of them. You know, he did the very close Fucinich versus Shakhaya fight. He did Ali Sadari against uh, Desme. He did a Lauren Murphy fight in the UFC. Go back to 2020, Robert Whitaker and Jared Cannonier. He did that. He did a Gamrot fight in the UFC. He did Cage Warriors again with Jack Carwright in the championship fight. 
which came down two rounds to 2019. Let's go back. Paraness over in KSW. Another cage wars. We have 2019, we have 2018, we have 2017, 2016, 2015, 14, and 13. David Ledeby has been judging all of those years. Many, many, many fights. That is the judge you want judging these fights. Right? That is the sort of judge you want judging these fights. You go to Clemens Werner. He's judging UFC this year. Uh, v- Vittori against Whitaker. Uh, obviously, the, the fight we were just talking about. He's judged Shoshinko versus Santos. He judged a KSW last year. Judged a KSW again. Judged in the UFC uh, multiple times. You know, on uh, the split decision mark here, I'm, I'm looking at his last two years. He's only one split decision in, in those two years. None the year before in 2020. In 2019, none. In 2018, none. In 2016, none. That is a hot top, top class judge. That, that, those are the sort of judges. So you want the experienced judges in there doing these big fights. And that's what we need. The problem is, how do you get experienced judges? Well, do you know what? You go to KSW, you go to Cage Warriors, you go to LFA if you're in America. You, you come on your way up and you do a bit of belt or you do a bit of PFL. You, maybe you get in the UFC after you've done your 400 fights. <laughs> you know, then, then you do maybe a couple of undercard fights. And then after five or six UFCs, you get in and you do... Tony Ferguson versus Nathan Diaz in the main event. You know? That's how that's how it should be done. And the problem is here, and this 10-10 round was given because we had an inexperienced judge who panicked, who hasn't done it enough, uh, who went against the criteria. And that's exactly what happened. Because we usually do see very good judging in the UFC. And maybe people are thinking, what are you talking about, Sean? Let's look at the, la- and the front page of MMA Decisions, last three cards, Right? UFC 278, Tybora versus Rachmanov, uh, no dissenting split decision there, no yellow here in MMA decisions. Dash Philly, Aldo, no yellow. Costa, Rock, Rockhold, no yellow, so no split decisions there. Uh, UFC Paris, no split decisions there. Right? No split decisions. ZM fight, Hackbrath fight, Wood fight, Gomez fight, Imavov fight, Winokur fight, none there. There was, uh, there was two last night or, or uh, last Saturday night um, and two very close fights the Rodriguez Jing Yang fight and the Ness Weeks fight and the, the, the second part I wanted to talk about here actually and, and you know so that's how many fights there 10, 15 fights you have two split decisions and they're two very very close fights um, we the, ju- the level of judging is very very good and the only standout thing that was categorically wrong in that was that 10-10 from an experienced judge not saying this guy's a bad judge and won't be a good judge in the future but at the moment he is inexperienced now the second part I want to talk about here is is this specific to that fight I just mentioned Rodriguez versus uh, Xing Liang it was a fight right that I, I tweeted out my score afterwards and I got 29-28 to Lee um but I thought the first round was very, very close. And, you know, I've obviously I found myself in this position now where people, for some reason, listen to my, uh, my judging talk. And <clears throat> you had people using that tweet uh, as to say, Rodriguez was robbed. You know, Sean says it. Sean says Lee won, Rodriguez was robbed. I absolutely don't think that. I was sitting there at the end of the first round and I was thinking, God almighty, who am I going to do? What tweet am I going to send here? Am I going to send Rodriguez or am I going to send Jing Gang? And that's a guy sitting at home 3,000 miles away, whatever it is. I always overestimate it. Is it 3,000? I don't know. A good few miles away, right? The judges up close can see that way better than me, right? They can see what's happening way better than me. They can see the, they can hear the impact. They can feel the impact. They can see who's getting hurt way better than me. Now, all three of these rounds were, were close. I, I, I Honestly, I, I scored the, the, the and let me, I'll just click it in here again, but I scored the second round to Lee. I thought that was the clearest round. And two judges actually scored that for Rodriguez. So that'll tell you how different it is. And, you know, Michael Bell, have great respect for him. Very good judge. Ron McCarthy agreed with me on that round, but had it... No, he actually had it for, for Jing Liang, but he uh, he scored the third round for Jing Liang, which I I didn't. <laughs> so uh, And Douglas Crosby... Um, I wouldn't say Douglas Crosby is the best judge in the world. To be honest, here, you know, I'm not anti-judging union here, but... Uh, so there's, a, there's look, that was one of those fights. There's a lot of differences there, but we have to remember they're very close rounds. And this is the thing, right? The difference between the um, uh, calling around incorrectly judge and disagreeing 
on the judging of a round. Because I would say all of these three rounds, you can disagree, but you can understand the way a judge would give it to one person. I thought in the first round that Jing Yang was just a bit faster. And I thought his body shots and his kind of leg kicks were landing and, and you know, kind of close in shots. And then John Anik said he's only landed one head shot, one significant head shot. Now, you can add the jabs into that maybe. And I'm, Jesus, that kind of made me think. I was like, well, geez, am I watching the same fight here? And I, like when, <laughs> when you're a judge and when you're looking for impact and when you're basing it on impact alone, which you should be, which is the way to do it, you know, effective striking and grappling, maybe you look at that Lee round a little bit differently. You know, maybe you're thinking, okay, Lee might be looking, doing the classier, better work here. And it was a close round, but the more thump is coming from um, Rodriguez. The problem as well with this round, and I think the, the fan kind of reaction to it was, Rodriguez obviously outweighed Jing Liang by so much that people had like, oh, come on, Jing Liang, I want you to win this fight because you're the underdog and you're, you know, you're the gangster. And he had a, it was a great week for Jing Liang. No one probably emerges as the biggest star from, uh, from this week as Jing Liang. But it is a fight that we can disagree with, but I think we have to understand that judges can score a different way. The judges are splitting every round. That's very unusual. I'll tell you, go back, go to them made decisions and go back through it where the judges are splitting every single round. Now, I'm not, I'm not slating any judges or anything for that. I'm just saying it's unusual. But it's something, it's something that probably, or, you know, not probably, but could be more usual could happen more because there are lots of rounds that can swing lots of different ways just because you think a round scored one way or you see it one way it doesn't mean someone else would see it that way it doesn't mean a judge who is really really good at judging rounds and seeing the intricacies and seeing what actually makes the difference it doesn't mean they will score a different way and I think my larger point here and I'll kind of maybe end it on this is that at at some t- at at some point we're gonna have to trust the judges because whenever I talk to them, and I I think this is something that we really need to reconcile with as well, um, that they know so much more than us in terms of the small little intricacies that decide who wins a round. You know, I often see something happening around, and I say it to one a judge, and. They tell me something that I'd never even thought of, you know? It's like, I said, look, this was a big shot. Look at, look, look at the reaction. And they kind of say to me, look, it's the react, you know, you, you, you base it on the reaction, but you also must base it on the, the you know, the, the impact of the shot that comes before the reaction too. If you have a big reaction to nothing, well, like, you know why someone might have twisted their ankle you can't you know you can't score for that you have to base it on both of those things kind of put together now if there is a big shot and there is a big reaction absolutely give it like that but you know maybe that's a bad example but there are other examples as well of like sometimes it comes toward this is a very good example I think actually sometimes a fight comes towards the end of the round someone gets hit maybe knocked down the, the bell it finishes how how you score that, I think, is a very intricate thing. And that's a thing judges are like, they keep their eyes peeled on it to see the reaction of the fighter straight afterwards. If that fighter pops back up, sits in his stool, perfect. It might, might be lucky. The, their stool might be right there. The, the corner might come in quick. What if the corner comes in clo- slow or at the other side of the cage and they have to fall over towards the stool? That's a problem as well because the judge only has maybe two or three seconds to write down their score before they see that reaction. Maybe that changes the whole round. But those are the sort of small things, the sort of intricacies that the judges have to look out for to get these rounds and that, uh, to get these rounds scored correctly. And you see in fights like this Zheng Liang Rodriguez fight, we're sitting at home, we're drinking our our uh, our diet coke or our you know our, our Mardello or whatever it might be, and maybe we were talking to our brother or our girlfriend or texting someone or looking at Shawnee podcast tweets or something, and then we look come to the end of the round and go ten nine Ling Jing Liang, right? We uh, let's all admit it. We've all done that. We uh, we we've all done that. Do you know who's not doing that? the judge sitting in that seat and they're the ones who get the abuse and they're the ones who have to put their head up in the parapet to um to to put themselves in a position to be called a cheat and to be to to be told that their score is a robbery and all of that 
right? They're the ones going out there actually doing it. And I think there's a drive in, in sports worldwide, especially here in Ireland, in, in one of our, our sports, GA, there was a, a referee knocked out in a game. Just someone walked onto the pitch, knocked the referee out. And there's been like consternation over that. And rightly so. I think officials need a bit, little bit more respect and we need to understand a little bit more and I would love if they spoke more. I, I will happily speak to any judges and come on here and it, like if the commissions want to give me judges to do it, or what, I, I, I don't think anyone would be nicer than, than them, to them than me, right? But to get that understanding of, of the person, of, the, of why they're doing it, I don't think it's right to do it all the time. Maybe that's what we're, for another podcast in terms of coming out afterwards and talking about these scores. But I think if we have a wider knowledge on judging and a wider understanding for the little intricacies of judging, we will be so much, so much better. And you know, the only people that can tell us that are the judges. I do my best. I talk to judges all the time. I spend years talking to judges and I try to give you little bits of details here that they've given me so we can be better. But the only people really who can do it, the best people to do it are the judges themselves. And uh, hopefully we see more of that. All right, I will leave it there. I know they do. maybe this is a little bit of a controversial one and people won't like it, but I said in, within all the chaos, we need to still think there's a very big, important part of our sport that, uh, that exists. I'm Sean Sheehan. This is Sherdog.com, and I'll see you all next time.